Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast, covering the people and places about fly fishing in Ireland. I'm Dara Whelan and on this week's show I'm speaking to fly fishing history writer Andrew Hurd. Andrew is probably best known for his immense history of fly fishing series, but most recently he has also written the Blacker trilogy about William Blacker, a Wicklow salmon fly tyer in the 19th century who, upon moving to London, brought the Irish style to the fore and helped revolutionise British salmon fly tying in the process. Andrew Hare tells me about Blacker and other Irish fly tires who had such an impact on the salmon fly tying world in the 19th century, but I first asked him about his own transition from a medical career to writing about the history of fly fishing itself. They always used to say when I was at work that I only practised medicine as a hobby, um, which may have some degree of truth in it. But it, no, I don't know. I mean, I just do it for relaxation. So that's um, why I have so much time for it. it. It's never been a bother putting something down on paper. I don't really even have to think about it much. So <laughs> while I know for a lot of people it's hard work, for me it's nothing like that. And I, I just sort of can do it. And and that's why I, I would never have written so much if I'd, I'd had to work at it. Um, I don't think I'm really that persistent. Are you Are you still practicing medicine? No, no, no. I'm retired now. I'm retired early, so um, so now I, I in the winter I tend to write more, and in the summer I tend to fish more, and it just depends on on what's on. So at the minute, I'm I'm writing, and but within I don't know eight weeks, perhaps I'll be fishing again. So. So it all um, it, it balances out through the year. Uh... Did you set out to be a fly fishing writer? Because obviously, fly fishing was your first love, and you know that was like you said, you were kind of practicing medicine part time nearly. But was writing something that you kind of said, "Oh yeah, this is something I want to kind of focus in on"? No, I'd done it. I'd been doing it since I was nineteen. I mean, it's a very long story, but I used to write um, for the medical magazines mainly, and I used to write occasional bits and pieces for trout and salmon and and for various magazines, some of which are now dead, not to mention their owners. But the, um, so I, I didn't really do have much to do with writing about angling until the fateful day when John Ward Allen sent me an email saying, would I like to write for Waterlog? When I asked what Waterlog was, and he said, it's a literary angling magazine. And I just, I sent him an email back, which very fortunately his uh, sister-in-law s- saved. And it said, you know, you're crazy. There isn't space for the number of angling magazines there are. A literary one will be complete financial suicide. You know, don't bother ringing me. You know, I'll call you, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and um, I really laid it down on the line. And I, I just assumed he was unhinged. And um, then I, a few months later, I walked into the bookshop in the town, not the bookshop, the newsagents in the town where I work, and there was this magazine on the shelf. And I looked at the cover, and I just had this feeling that I knew what I was looking at. So I bought a copy, and it was the one and only time they ever stopped Waterlog, was they stopped the first issue of it. And I rang him back and I said, I still think it's financial suicide, <laughs> but if, if you are still prepared to take me after the email I sent, I'll definitely write for this. And that, that was how I, uh, how I really got going as an angling writer. I had no intention of doing it. And, and if anything from Waterlog, which obviously isn't around anymore, although you describe it as maybe it's just been put into hibernation for the meantime. Yes. Um, that really developed your, um, I suppose, the publisher-writer um, relationship, which came to the fore then. Oh. It did. Well, basically, it's quite. It, it, it makes it a lot easier if your publisher is one of your best mates. Um, it, um, I mean, I just worked so closely with John over all the years that Waterlog was going. And, and because we share a common interest in the history of angling that's what I largely ended up writing about I suppose I mean like many things in life you don't plan to get where you are here you just arrive and I mean but in fact it was another another coincidence that got me writing about the history of of fly fishing and that also happened in Ireland tell me about that Basically, I I had my my wife has uh, relations in in Ireland in Castle Town Roach, 
And Patrick knew a huge amount about the history of fly fishing. And I was I was spellbound by this because I suddenly realized that that actually the reason we did many things that we do today was because of things that have been decided a hundred years ago. And I, I kind of always wondered why some things in fishing were as they were. And and talking to Patrick, I realized why. And all these people who are just names to me, like like Frederick Holford and Skews and people like that, I, I suddenly began to realize that they actually affected what I did right now. And I was keen on the idea of Patrick writing a book about this, but he had a farm to run. And so he he never did. And in the process of encouraging him, I eventually wrote enough stuff that I thought, well, hold on a second, this wouldn't be hard to turn into a book. And I did, and that became The Fly, and um, it's now in its fourth edition, um, which, I mean, I must admit, I never thought it would do, but there you go. That's fascinating, actually, Andrew. So, so how you came to write the history of fly fishing was actually through initially an Irish contact and, and kind of Irish information. Oh, ab- ab- absolutely. I cannot think of the book without thinking of Ireland. I mean, I've never been able to do it. I, I, I mean, it was back in the uh, in the days when Ireland really was a place, and triple parking of tractors outside the pub was nothing on a Friday night. Um, it was. Um, I we had such good times there, and it, it was. Um, you know, the, the country has a, a, a absolutely unquenchable spirit. Um, and I think it was largely that that got me going, because, which is why I, all my books have tended to feature an Irish theme in them somewhere. Yeah. And have you gotten a chance to fish much over here, Andrew? Oh, yeah. I Over the years. I haven't fished in Ireland lately, but I fished the Blackwater, the Lown, the Lee. Um, I fished the Big Lakes, Carra especially. Um, and I'm just about anywhere else you, you, the Slaney, I mean, lots of, lots of places. I mean, like I fished places in Ireland where I wasn't even certain where we were and whether we should be fishing there when it boils down to it. Any particular favourites? Um, the Orbeg. The Orbeg, I, mean, I think, I mean, it's very, very difficult fishing in places. I mean, I, I... I'd fished on chalk streams, and I I started fishing on the Orbeg for for wild trout, and I really learned what the difference was between wild fish and stocked fish. I mean, that was an education. Yeah, it's, um, it's college they, level, um, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, the Orbeg, the the bit I fished in in Castle Town Roach was, um, I mean, it was like gin clear was would be a very poor description of it. It was at least as clear as carrot. And the problem was, they're mostly only about three or four foot deep. So the trout could see you from 100 yards away. And if you made one false move, they were all gone. So it was, um, it, I certainly learned a lot about not making any quick movements there. Um, I want to ask you just, because when I read the hit, The Fly, as it was initially called, um, which then became the history of fly fishing, and I'm a history graduate, um, so I know about research and getting your facts right, and I was blown away by the amount of work and information and research that must have gone into that, especially because you were encompassing centuries. What was the kind of work process behind that like in terms of where you're just going off research in, you know, 10 hour days, finding information wherever you could, where you going down to the light. How did it work? It took about 10 years to do it. I mean, the, the problem with it was, I mean, I, 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 if I actually approached it as early on in my career writing books and I know how much work was involved, I think I would have given up straight away, but I sort of lack imagination in that department. What I, what I did originally was I wrote it as a series of essays, and that was all it was going to be. And then the essays got to the point where they were too long to publish as essays. So I, I, I thought, well, I'll just put these together. And I realized I had, um, by then, they were about 20,000 words or something. And it kind of went completely wrong after that and ended up as a, a, a lengthy book. A lot of it boiled down to sitting down and, well, thinking differently, I think. The most, 
I, I got into a different way of thinking while I was writing it because most of the books that have been written up to that point follow what's called a parade of authors. You sit down, you read the literature, and you say, you know, like George Bainbridge says this, you know, and then so on all the way down the line. And I, I thought, you know, like enough of this has been written that we don't really need any more of it. So I, I started thinking, well, okay, what's really changed things? And in fact, it was it was developments in fishing tackle and social changes that don't mainly change fly fishing in Ireland. I mean, really, it is a country where that that is very apparent. Um, but but even with something like the dry fly, for example, when the dry fly, something like it, had been fished from time immemorial, floating flies, but it was only when they started to really concentrate on the idea of fishing a fly upstream, that they discovered the rods weren't good enough to keep drying the fly. So early on in dry fly or floating fly fishing, they're really only putting the fly on the water, hoping a fish takes it. And then if they leave it on the water too long, it sinks. So then Greenheart comes along and they now can false cast the fly and dry it, but it takes about five minutes to do it. And so the method changes a wee bit, and then split cane comes along, and now two or three false casts, and you can dry a fly pretty well. But floating doesn't appear till 1895. At that point, you can treat the fly so it floats, and the whole game changes, and then the eyed hook comes along. And the history of fly fishing is more about how the tackle changes, or as much about how the tackle changes as anything else. But from a tackle perspective, Andrew, is it very much a case of that the anglers were pushing the evolution of of the tackle? And like literally it was only when the kind of the equipment then evolved um, that you yeah. see the evolution of, of the sport. It's a partnership. I mean, the, the two go hand in hand, but it is, um, it's as much development in the tackle make things possible as the as the ideas that anglers have so there are there are few 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 revolutions or evolutions in fly fishing which rely purely on the idea that that some person has about well let's do it differently and when those when people do come up with those ideas then they really are revolutionary um but but generally it was just an evolution i mean salmon fishing being the perfect example of it i mean it it Salmon flies are completely artificial things, um, which have got a huge and and entertaining history to them, but they're completely beside the point because salmon will take, you know, any kind of fly you throw its way, if the fish are taking, they'll take it. It doesn't matter what the design looks like. So so it's a... uh, Parallel process. The play of those two things, yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's turn to the, the Blacker trilogy. Um, I haven't been able to afford it <laughs> yet. Um, I know. <laughs> it's, it's but it's one of those you look at it and go, oh, that's a wish list. That's one for a, a retirement present or something like that. Um, tell me about the background to that and then how you really kind of focused in on, on the Irish fly tying influence. That, I mean, the book itself was a complete accident. I had no plans to write anything about Blacker. And a, a, a German publisher called Hermann Dietrich Trotsch, who um, owns Motor Press, or part of, of Motor Press of Stuttgart, um, had been collecting Blacker's books for years, and I'd heard about him from John Head, the bookseller. And one day Herman rang me up and says, I'd like to do this book on Blacker, and I've collected quite a lot of his books and stuff like that. I was unprepared for how many of Blacker's books Herman had produced. I mean, I've just never, ever seen so many in my life. Um, they're very rare. And John and Herman said, um, you know, I'd like a biography of Blacker to go with this. And, and basically I said, okay. And I think that most 2,000 words have been written about Blacker ever, and the majority of uh, books followed Eric Tabner, authors just copied him and said, Blacker is a bit behind the times. And, you know, like, he, they, they kind of treated him as a bit of a hick from the stick. And I'd seen his books, though, and I, uh, with, with the, the Herman had, and I mean, I just couldn't make the two things add up 
And I, I said to him, and there's got to be more to this story than meets the eye. And then I just sat down and I just through dint of hard work and, and, and looking everywhere I possibly could, I managed to assemble the story of Blacker's life. And it's completely different to anything you would imagine. You know, this is a guy with huge artistic abilities, possibly, well, one of the, the greatest fly tires who ever lived. And he leaves Ireland at a time when the country was, was it not, it was before the famine. It wasn't, it, it, times were hard, but they weren't that hard. And he went to London basically to make his fortune at a time when there were other more famous fly tires in Ireland, but none with his drive. And then he just turns up in London and within a few years, he has completely changed the face of British fly fishing by introducing them to the Irish style of fly tying, which was known about. But, I mean, he just, like, took... He opened Pandora's box, and when the, the, the influential British anglers saw what was inside, it, it swept them away. And within a decade, everyone was tying flies to the Irish style. It wipes out what we would know, I would call the British style, and it became so, such, so much the rule that flies like the Jock Scott and the Durham Ranger, which would have been impossible before Blacker arrived in Britain because no one knew how to tie them, they became famous flies by the middle of the, the 1840s. And they are just direct descendants of the Irish fly tires. And the huge irony was that by the time George Kelson wrote, and even Francis Francis, people have forgotten how big the Irish influence had been, and the British, in an act of unforgivable cultural imperialism, just stole the Irish style from from the country it belonged to and made it their own. Why was the Irish style so influential? It basically, if you um, were in the process of publishing a book called The Story of the Salmon Fly, which I'm doing with Bob Franson, who's tied 1,200 flies for it, and I, I, as I was photographing the flies, I, I was faced with the question you just asked. And, and it was only when I started photographing basically 500 years of salmon flies told by Bob Franson, I suddenly realized what happened. I, you, it was just there before your eyes. And you, it was only when you saw the flies that it suddenly became so apparent. British salmon flies were... Um, well, they were just like big trout flies, really. They they tended to have strip wings. They The wings were always made of a single type of feather. And while the flies could be very colourful, they, 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 they all more or less followed the same formula. But when the Irish got going on it, at some point, somebody in Ireland, probably in the late 18th century, because the oldest known salmon flies, which date from them, are Irish, and they started to experiment with golden pheasant, which was really rare at the time. And they, people like Cornelius O'Gorman, some of whose flies survived, started tying it with flies. And they started to build a different type of wing. Instead of just putting in a single type of feather like bronze mallard or turkey or something in a strip, they started putting in mixed up fibers from different birds. So you've got a much more interesting wing. And they, having done that, which is called a mixed wing, where they left all the fibers free, they then came up with a second sort, which they did really early on, where they tied in two feathers back to back and then put on extra bits of feather, single fibers and maybe strips around it. And typically the two feathers they built this wing around were golden pheasant tipping. And guess what? That style went on to become the Jock Scott and the Durham Ranger of this world, which are built just around a very, what was a 50-year-old Irish design of salmon fly. And then they invented a third style of tying fly. I mean, I don't know where these guys got hold of the, the, this, this passion for invention, but it all comes out of Ireland. And they just used golden pheasant toppings. And those flies were staggeringly expensive, but they were amazingly distinctive, and they became known as Parsons. So all of a sudden, the Irish have invented all of the three main types of winging that salmon flies need, and they've basically done it 
decades before any of these flies turn up in Britain. And that was what began to change the British style. And the Irish also started adding in ostrich hill heads. They, they, they didn't invent jointed bodies, but they certainly took them to another level. They, they routinely added in tails to flies made out of stuff like golden pheasant and, and other parrot, you know, more exotic materials. They probably were, well, they were the first to put horns, blue and yellow macaw horns on salmon flies. And virtually everything about the classic salmon fly that, that makes it classic actually comes from these original Irish models. Is there, I don't know, were you able to find any records or anything, um, Andrew, in terms of delving into the kind of creative influences in Ireland at the time? Was there a particular area, river? Like, like you said, it's kind of where did this creative revolution come from? Well, basically, as far as the Shannon and the Urn, is is probably the the um, Galway. I mean, you had to, if you just drew a big circle around Galway, they they it 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 probably comes from that area, and which makes sense because Galway was a port and it probably took a fair few feather shipments, and golden pheasants came to Europe quite late on and they were expensive birds, but whatever it was, the Galway fly tires suddenly started to to do this, and it um. It then and then it spread all over Ireland from there, um, but it, it and to England via via Blacker, but but they were also visiting English anglers began to come to Ireland in the the early nineteenth century, mainly because of steamships. It was you could get to places like um, like the North fairly easily on a steamship, and you could get to the Shannon. I mean, nobody in those days really went west of the Shannon because there were no roads that were usable when it was wet. But there was this concentration on the, on the, on those particular centres, and so they, it was their style that made it into Britain. But one thing is for certain: there was nothing in Britain like it at that time. I mean, it was it was only from the 1840s onwards, really, that you begin to see the, the flies of this style appearing in Britain in any quantity. And, and why blacker then in terms of was it was it going to be inevitable that some Irish person was going to land in, in England and, you know, make this style kind of more popular over there and it just happened to be blacker or was there something about blacker that he enabled this? It was, I think it just happened to be blacker. I mean, there were plenty of other people who could have done it. I mean, there was... Um, um, Dan O'Shaughnessy, for instance, I mean, who was he, he was in a, in a position to do it, but unfortunately, um, or fortunately, I, I I don't think Dan was really an entrepreneur. I mean, he he liked the idea of spending all day filing the bulb of a hook out of the metal, um, and also, I mean, he he drank himself out of this world into the land of the spirits. So I don't think he would have probably been a been much of a businessman. Martin Kelly, I mean, he, he certainly could have done it. He was a tire at least as talented as Blacker, but he was, I think he made too good a living in Ireland. Uh, Pat Hearns was another one who, who really did know how to tire fly, and I've seen Pat Hearns flies. No, not as good as Martin Kelly's, but I mean, certainly good enough. But it was Blacker who made the move. When Blacker moved to England, did he move to England with the express purpose of making a career out of his fly tying? Oh, yeah. He, he moved over in the late 1830s. Initially, he went to Scotland, um, we think, but he ended up in London pretty quick. And he worked for a guy called Evert, who was another Irish fly tire. And Evert was, was selling flies, and Blacker became his foreman. And um, I don't think Evert was selling anything particularly fancy. And, and after a, a couple of years, Blacker clearly decided he could do better on his own. And so he 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 married a, a a girl who was older than he was, and she ran, as Providence would have it, a dyers and scourers, which is the equivalent of today's dry cleaning shop. But it, they dyed things, and that must have made a big difference to Blackett because all of a sudden he had someone who really knew how to dye to learn from, and so he I think his dyeing of feathers just went up a notch. And, and and then he set out. He did something no one else had done. He set out on a journey to make contacts. 
And what he did was he tied this huge portfolio of salmon flies. I mean, can you imagine if he turned up today, what it'd be worth? And he went round Scotland and he advertised in the papers saying, William Blacker, you know, the greatest fly tire who ever lived, you know, is, is visiting your area. This is your only chance to buy, buy a William Blacker fly. I mean, it was at that kind of level. And he also did something else. He printed a little book. It was only 38 pages long. And he put flies into this book and sold it. And he would sign copies. And if you wanted, if you paid more, he would put in a salmon fly. So he was a great sales and marketing guy. Oh, I mean, hey. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, it was perfect. And when he came back, he had lots of contacts. And people were mail ordering flies from him, which was, you know, he, which was done much more than people realized way back into the 18th century. And he he set up probably in the back of Sarah's shop tying flies. And within a, a year of producing that first book, he upgraded it. And then he produced a new edition, which was much, much, much longer and had even more flies in it. And then he started selling flies to really famous anglers. And he just tirelessly promoted himself. He He, he didn't advertise a lot. But he put himself about a great deal. So he intentionally went with the purpose of, 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 of making money at business. One thing he never did, he never forgot Ireland. And he, he was always sending money back home to charity. And during the famine, he, he and, and um, his friend uh, Edward Fitzgibbon, Ephemera, they both sent money back to Ireland. Um, and uh, I don't think Blacker ever lived a, a... He was never a rich man by any stretch of the imagination, but he was comfortable enough. Do you know where he was from, Andrew? Where was he born? Yeah. Wicklow. Oh, Wicklow, okay. He so, was born yeah. Wicklow in 1814. Um, within... In, oh, I can't remember the name of the place, but the the, the Ballykiss Angel um, that the, in the TV series that that filmed around the territory he knew, and the um, I mean it was it was there was a lot of mining there when he was born um, before he was born, but they hadn't really ruined the river at that stage, and you could catch lots of trout there. And then he moved north. His father collected excise for the mining company. They moved north to Belfast when he was a boy. And then at some stage, um, after he left school, which he did as soon as he decently could, he went up to the bush and the ban, and he had something to do with fishing there. I don't know quite what. And we've never been able to figure it out. But he, he, he spent a few years there tying, we think, and selling flies to people. And then he came over to Britain. And he's written a, a number of books, has he? Blacker, he did three. I mean, he did the... Um, his, in 1842, he published one that was 38 pages long. Then he added an extra 10 pages to it six months later. Then he produced... Uh, in 1843, he produced an edition which had 130 pages in. And then in 1855, he produced the one that everybody knows, which has gone, I forget, 155 pages. And the, but that book is his swan song, really. It wasn't the book that made him famous. The one that, that brought him to national attention is one that very few people have seen or know about, which is the 1843 one. That had 100 salmon flies in. At that stage, nobody had ever seen a book with 100 salmon flies in. The most they'd ever seen was about 20. A lot of books only had five or six in, and they very often repeated the same flies. So effectively, when Blacker published that book, he doubled the number of salmon flies that anybody knew about in print. And the other thing about him was he invented the first um, emerger pattern for catching trout. He tied this to catch body emerger called the winged larva. And on their accounts of him just cleaning up with this, he was a fantastic fisherman. And he used it to catch salmon on the surface. Right. 60 years before anybody even thought about it. Did he hang around with kind of the elite of the fly angling community? I mean, he was, um, I mean, London in, well, Britain in those days was, say, was socially stratified is an understatement. I mean, they, they were, um, he, he, I don't think Blacker was that kind of guy. I, I don't think he was interested in, in, um, in brown nosing to, um, to to the uh, to the upper classes particularly, 
Um, he was quite a mature individual, and but he, on the one hand, he knew that they paid for his his way of life largely, but on the other, he didn't didn't really get mixed up with it. He, um, I think, most of the time, he just worked. Um, he 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 worked in the shop. He tied flies. He 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 ran the business. He sold tackle. Uh, I don't think he, like most tackle shop owners, he didn't get to fish anywhere near as much as he liked. Um, and um, his great friend was Edward Fitzgibbon, a femur, who a lot of people know through his books. And although it's always said that a, that a femur was black as patron, in practice, that was not the case. I mean, they, a blacker helped a femur out much more than, than a femur helped blacker out in a, in a lot of ways, because when Edward Fitzgibbon began writing his books, he didn't know anything about salmon fishing and, in fact, hadn't caught one. So, interestingly, then, the influence then of, of the Irish style became subsumed and taken over then by the British um, angling community. And then, like you said, the kind of Irish style was, was kind of forgotten about then in the ages to follow. It, it became popular because the, 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 the thing about the Irish style is that there's a difference between it and the British style. The, uh, the the Irish style flies are, are tied to catch a much bigger quarry than fish, and they're very successful at it. And as people realised that the the earning potential of these flies, and they saw how attractive they are, and I mean, when people go fishing for salmon at, at that time or when they went. They, they, money was beginning to, to come into the equation. And salmon fishing was becoming the thing that the Victorian businessmen did. There were some things they couldn't really easily do, like hunting, like, like hunting foxes or deer. And that, that was something they couldn't easily get into, but they could go shooting and they could go fishing. And so these flies were ideal. You, know, you could open your fly book, as it then was, and you could show a book full of these flies, and you could impress the hell out of your mate, which, in the same way as people might turn up in some brand new German staff car and say, "Hey, look at what, look at my wheels," you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a fascinating story. And uh, did you, did you delve much into the Rogans and Bali Shannon? I'm always fascinated with their um, their enterprise up there. Yeah. I, I, well, I, that's sort of been a sort of part time hobby of mine. I knew, um, when Rogan's actually got relaunched by, um, David and Connie Seeley, we were at the, um, at the launch, I mean, all those years ago. And I, 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 I was very sad that the thing ended the way it did because it was a business that deserves to be relaunched. And the, the, the Rogans, Rogans have become famous almost despite themselves. They, um, the, the, uh, it's odd because they, in a way, they belong to the sort of the, the second or even the third generation of Irish fly ties. And the Rogans were made famous by people like Francis Francis and High Regan, uh, Dunn. I, he was a man. Hey, I mean, he, um, he founded the, um, he founded one of the Irish, big Irish political parties, and he fell out with Parnell, I seem to recall. Um, and he ran guns. I mean, like, no, but the story of High Regan is just amazing. I mean, he was a gun runner. He got taken prisoner by the Maoris in New Zealand. Oh, I mean, hey, what a man. Um, but they, they, so the Rogans, I mean, although they're, they're very well known, they, they, they basically were sort of removed from the, the, the real burst of creativity in Irish fly time. So they came along later and they, they deserved to be well known and they tied some very famous flies. But they were a bit kind of, uh, they were slightly late to the party in a sense. And the, the, the group of Irish tires I think the most interesting are people like Martin Kelly and Blacker, mainly because I, nobody knows who they are, but the moment you lay eyes on a Martin Kelly fly, you know you're looking at something that was tied by someone who really, really was well clocked. The Blacker Trout, it's an incredible story, and I've seen the pictures just of the production of the book. Like the, It's just it's something to behold. It's a luxurious item, and um, it's you know, it got 
we got awarded the Classic Angling Book of the Year award. So it's it's obviously done incredibly well. Um, but you're working at the moment, um, Andrew, on the story of the salmon fly. And again, is That's that right. is that you had to end it up at the year eighteen eighty three, because uh, otherwise you'd be going on for multiple volumes. Um, but just give me an idea of the kind of um, the production of that. You're saying is that there's going to be twelve hundred flies tied for it? Was it? Well, in, in the uh, Bob Ty, Bob Franson. I mean, I love this book because I mean, basically it's been been uh, the flies have been tied by by a great friend of mine, Bob Franson, in Australia. <laughs> Bob has never caught a salmon. He's 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 tied salmon flies, classic salmon flies, all his life. The uh, the book basically covers the salmon fly from the first ones that we know about, which is you know back in the 17th century, really, up to 1883. And the reason we choose that uh, cut off is that basically is the point where the, the married wing salmon fly comes along. Uh, and and the Kelson era, if you want to call it that, begins. And if we covered that, the book would have to be in two volumes. And and my, I, I I don't want to do that to people. So so the aim is to keep the book down to a sensible size. We'll feature about six hundred and fifty of Bob's flies in it, and um, and then we'll see you. See how how sales go. If they do well, then we'll do do a, a second volume to carry on. The what we're really covering in the book is is the period I've talked about from the days of the early strip wing salmon flies that the that were tied in England, Scotland, and Wales. It, the and then, then the emergence of the the Irish mixed wing style before anybody started actually marrying the the fibers of the of the wings together it's the most fun period of fly tying to my mind none of the flies had names and in fact the fly tying instructions are just chaotic and they they were written down as a stream of consciousness the the um, blacker is is thought by many people to be quite bad but he's by no means the most confusing one when it comes to instructions it was just a wild west period of fly tying and it was all the better for it Tell me this. Like I thought it was fascinating, because like, you're you're telling me that um you actually asked Bob to tie the flies exactly as they would have appeared if they'd been bought in a shop at the time. So you're really yeah. getting a sense of kind of being brought back to that period to really get a to see exactly what they were fishing with and what they were they were looking at. Yeah, the the reason for it is I I mean you'll probably be familiar with the uh, fly tying circuit, but the um. Basically, the, the what, what we were keen to get away from was we didn't want to tie stuff which uh, basically looked like modern classic salmon flies. The 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 I mean I I think the the sort of show flies you see are wonderful, but they don't look like like the real salmon flies did in the 19th century. I mean I there's a frame in the Fly Fishers Club of George Kelson's flies. Um, which the fly fishers got a couple of years ago, and if you look at, if you, I promise, if I took a picture of one of those flies and showed it on on Facebook or somewhere, and asked people who tied it, and asked them what they thought of the standard of the tying, they would just say, "What shit is this?" I mean, the standard, the 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 style of flies has changed greatly over the years and, and the, the standard of tying today is absolutely out of this world but the flies don't look like they used to so so the idea of this book was to present flies looking as they did in that time and we've seen enough to know what they look like then and I've got a lot of experience in, in how they should look and after that people are free to tie them however they, they want I mean I, I've got Sort of no, I I don't think the the modern way of tying some classic salmon flies is great. I love to look at them, but what we wanted to do was show the flies as anglers knew them, and and Bob is just a master at this. Uh, Bob, if you give Bob a fly to copy, he will copy the imperfections in the technique. Uh, absolutely. If the body's uneven in a particular place, Bob's fly will have a bump there. And tell me this, so when is the book due out, Andrew? 
Do you like this year? Um, I mean, publishing is one of those things. It's a, it's a bit like making love to an elephant. There's a lot of roaring early on, and then nothing happens for a very long time. It, it, um, I, I would think it'll be out third quarter, something like that. But it, it depends very much on on how the design goes. There's there's a lot of images to put in the book. Um, I, just under half the number though were in blacker, and we've got to somehow get those into a book which is which is under 300 pages long. Um, so it, it, the design is going to take some time, but I would it'll be out. I would think by the autumn, maybe a bit before. And if people want to find it or keep an eye and kind of updates on it, where's the best place to go? If they if they log on to Medal of Press's website or they, they visit Medal of Press, which is www.medalofpress.com, then they they search for either under my name as an author or they search for the story of the salmon fly, they can reserve a copy there. We haven't got a price up on it yet because we actually don't know how long the book will be, but, but it'll be in full colour and um, it'll be, um, we're going to produce something as nice as Black Air was, but we're going to make it a lot cheaper. I mean, uh, there was no way that Black, Black Air actually came out of cost, believe it or not. It actually cost £300 to print every one of those, those sets. So we just sold it for what it cost us to print. It sold out completely. It was. Uh, uh, I mean, it was. We we got we got some sets left mainly because the printer was absolutely ultra careful with the paper. Um, and at the end of it, they just gave us a present of about eighty extra sets. I mean, John and I simply could not believe it. So if if people want to get their hands on that, go to Medler Press as well. If people want to get the Blacker Trilogy, there are still some left, and we sold. And we planned a run of. Um, a fixed number I can't remember quite what and we, we sold all the copies we, we intended to sell but the print instead I mean, there's normally wastage on a big print run you get books where pages are folded badly where you know, they, for whatever reasons there's a technical problem with the binding that didn't happen I have never known it to happen on a book ever, ever, ever um, and the same printers when there was a book I did about Fly Fishers Club they did the same again I, so anyway, the uh, the story of the salmon fly is definitely going to them, and it will. Uh, I mean, their their printing is excellent. I mean, this this really, it really will show off the photography, and it will show off Bob's tying, and and it, it tells a story that's never been told before, and it tells it visually. There there are lots of flies in this book, the majority of them, that people will never have seen before. They, a lot probably haven't been tied for over a century and a half. Well, Andrew, I'm sure it's going to be a huge success. Um, if there's anything of your previous books to go by, um, make a brilliant birthday or Christmas present later in the year, so do keep an eye on that when it comes out. Andrew Hurd, author of so many fantastic fly fishing history books, um, and we'll keep an eye out for the story of the salmon fly uh, later this year. Thanks very much for joining me on the show. That was the incredible fly fishing historian Andrew Hurd who joined me on this week's Ireland on the Fly podcast. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. And I'll be back next week with another episode on the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. So do join me then.